Good morning and welcome to our webinar. Thank you for coming and congratulations on your commitment to never stop exploring new ideas. My name is Carlo Apro. I'm a strategic technical specialist at CNC Software, Master Cam. Every great leap of technolo technology is a result of someone thinking outside the box and trying something new, usually against the prevailing dogma. In this example, man cannot fly. It took 400 years to go from Leonardo's idea to a practical recorded flight. Moving from predictable to the unknown means taking a chance, a risk. Fear often blocks taking that step. Overcoming that fear can lead to new and exciting opportunities. Did you know that flight was possible over 5,000 years ago? The materials were available to build a Rogallo type hang glider way back then. Many textbooks were written in history on how to build a sailing ship, but textbook knowledge can only take you so far. Textbooks can help you learn existing practices. They give you information. Knowledge comes from experience. But imagination can make you soar. In 5,000 years, no one thought of using the sail for flying. We went to space before Francis Rogallo, a NASA engineer, invented a non-powered glider to help spacecraft recoveries. His invention started the sport of hang gliding in the 70s. The first of those were built from canvas, bamboo, and piano wire. Just imagine where could the variation be if someone imagined this 5,000 years ago. In today's, in today's webinar, we will not spend much time on how to run Mastercam. Let's pretend that we all know textbook Mastercam inside out. You will get a chance to see detailed presentations on how to run Mastercam from our AEs during these web, Wednesday webinars. We will explore applied imagination instead through a collection of stories from our customers. It is the carpenter, not the tool after all. Our customers innovate every day to solve the worst manufacturing challenges. This is what we call dynamic thinking. Let us indulge in some applied imagination together. Imagination that will take us from the three to a five axis realm and beyond. So what drives CNC machines? Yes, uh, most, most of you would say G-code, but more importantly, your imagination. Machining is an art driven by your imagination. Your CAD CAM and your CNC equipment would all sit idle without your imagination. This example shows one of our customers cutting a stair thread prototype out of wood experimenting with different cutting strategies using a circular saw and a ball nose cutter. Let me advance this to show the circular saw. So we're using that on a five axis machine and we are tilting this saw uh, to avoid collisions. I'm just gonna advance here because I have a lot of materials to go through. And here we are cutting that same shape with a ball nose cutter. So we are doing some experimentation thinking outside the box. This is part of our signature parts project, a collection of real life examples inspired by our customers. They are designed to demonstrate the combined power of Mastercam and our end user's imagination. This part came from this picture. Our goal is to step outside the textbook and show you the power of mass cam in, in context. So we are cutting each individu individual step. Uh, this is how we can picture it. And for the prototype, all we're doing is we machine one side and then we glue some lumber on and we will then machine that. 
this is just showing in the interface what this looks like. Why use a circular saw, you may ask? Because we are planning to cut these stairs threads from granite. As you can see, this machine has five axis heads with multiple tooling options. This circular saw can cut granite way more efficiently than a ball nose cutter. But we must gradually tilt the tool to avoid collisions. Let me just show you that here. But before we get into how to program a machine like this, let's start with a simple example. Let's exercise our imagination, dynamic thinking together. Imagine that you own a machine shop and your customer sends you this solid model. He wants you to make five parts. New customer wants to see your workmanship. What is the most important first step you will take? And this is a step you will not find in a textbook. Process planning, visualization. What you're visualizing depends on your ability, the tools and equipment you have. You will try to make these parts from what tools you already have so that you can keep the cost down. You will do the best job you can because you know that this is a test. If you do a good job, you may get a big order. Let's say that you have a two axis CNC late and a three axis CNC male. And let's pretend that we all know Mastercam inside out. So a likely first operation is turning. You probably will turn the material from a stock and end up with a part looking like this. The next operation would be building a fixture from what you already have at hand, a V block, clamp, and a vise. A good tool maker will go through the steps of indicating, make sure the, that V block is plumb and center, and then generate a few very simple contour and drilling operations. So let me just play the animation to cut the highlighted areas on this part. Very simple to the contouring operation here. So you would machine all five, five parts like this. And the next operation, you would flip the part over, orient the holes from the previous operation, install a staff for consistency, carefully clean the fixture, generate a simple contour tool pad to machine the highlighted area, and machine all five parts like this. Operation four, you would relocate the fixture to make sure and indicate that make sure it's level. Find the center again, orient the previously machined features and insta install a stop somewhere for consistency. Then machine the highlighted areas, again, animation, uh, using simple contour toolpath. So every toolpath is very simple. You will do everything very carefully. You will clean the picture in between, and you will probably use, lose money on these five, five parts. Now, you made all the decisions. The textbook only told you how to create toolpaths. You need to be a skilled toolmaker to make all this happen. So as a result, you got the job. 150 parts to be delivered in 30 days. Will you cut these the same way? Will you use dynamic thinking or will you say, let's not change. We have always done it this way and never had a problem. Can you improve your manufacturing process? Well, if you may have a simple rotary device to bolt onto your three axis machine, like this one here, and you can easily make a slight improvement to your existing fixture, basically just a plate that is bolted onto the V block. And then you may cut it this way. So we're using the same exact operations we used before, the same old school toolpaths, but we have eliminated a bunch of setup steps because you put the part in to this fixture once, and then the machine does the flipping for you. You don't have to clean the fixture in between. You only have to indicate it the first part, and you don't really need to be a skilled toolmaker to run this process. You can 
cut through the whole thing. And again, I'm going to jump ahead to show you how the machine flips, cuts that same 2D contour operation here, and then rotates again to cut the last operation here. So cutting it this way actually was simpler to do than cutting individual parts, thanks to our dynamic thinking which resulted in an even bigger order. Now, how can you deliver consistently on time, 500 parts per month for two years? By the way, this is how most of our customers progress. You are rewarded with more work as you prove your ability to deliver. Maybe it is time to upgrade to a meal turn machine. Let's look at this closely. We have eliminated more setups operations, and we are now using dynamic motion technology for both turning and milling operations. We will have a dedicated presentation on dynamic motion technology for one of our dynamic thinking webinars. Again, the textbook can tell you how to create each individual operation, but it will be up to you, your creativity and imagination to sequence the execution. The magic is in you. Now here we also upgraded the toolpath. This is the dynamic motion technology where we use the full flute of this is cutter and we maintaining constant engagement of the tool. So we are never overloading the tool which results in constant heat generation. That heat is actually going out with, with the chips resulting in longer tool, tool life in reduced cycle time. So we will use the latest Mastercamp technology. We will use file, um, part transfer, some pinch turning. So we are most efficient with our turning. We're doing turning and milling on the same operation. And by the way, we are simulating all this in simulation. And if there is any errors, we can see them here. And not only errors, we can see how the motion the machine is moving and we can make changes easily here. We can say, okay, I, I didn't like the way that of the sequence, I can make the changes here instead of committing to the machine and making it there. So putting it all into practice, I'm just gonna play this animation. If you look at this part here, it will be very challenging to cut this part on a three axis machine or to do it with only an indexing method. The truth is that most five axis jobs require a combination of many indexing and some simultaneous motion. Learning how to control a five axis machine will open many new possibilities for you. Trying something new brought us to here, but we still only scratched the surface of five axis possibilities. We have only used the very basic indexing five axis method where we attack, where we attacked depart from different but locked planes. Now we are using some four axis and five axis simultaneous motion for cutting some of the more complex features. Like if I go ahead and jump ahead here, this is still just positioning motion so far. We're doing right here, we're doing some four axis continuous motion to cut those fillets. And then as we progress further, more four axis. And then when we wanna cut this chamfer, see this chamfer, this inside and outside chamfer, we wanna cut that in one continuous motion. We, we must have five axis motion. So let's just jump ahead there. Here we're going, cutting that inside chamfer. And as you can see, we are following the chamfer, we are also oscillating that tool up and down. This way we can use the flute, the whole flute of the cutter more efficiently. So I'm just gonna go ahead, jump ahead. Uh, Mascam offers a toolbox full of five axis control so you can drive any CNC machine. Mascam is easy to learn. Our resellers are expert trainers 
You can also find Mastercamp textbook instructions online, and we have a very extensive context-sensitive help system. These dynamic thinking webinars are designed to help you with the non-textbook concepts of making multi-axis machines dance. Here are some of, some of the textbook concepts of how we control multi-axis machines. We have the three main controls. We have cut pattern, tool axis control, and collision control. Now, those of you who are coming from a three-axis world already familiar with cut pattern. A straight line is a cut pattern, a circle is a cut pattern, a zigzag, there is many cut patterns. Tool axis control is a new concept. Um, simple explanation is, say you have a normal to a surface. If I'm normal to a surface, I would be perpendicular to this surface. If I'm cutting down this blue line and I tilt the tool forward, we call that a lead angle. Leaning backwards would be a lag angle. Side tilt angle is we will lean sideways. We can lock our tool to a plane. We can uh, use lines. We could draw some lines along our, our cut pattern and tell Mastercam, just align my tool to those lines as you go along. You can create a point in space. And if this is my cut pattern, this, this blue line, sorry. Um, so if th this blue line is my cut pattern, my point is the from point for my tool axis control. Mastercam will follow the cut pattern with the nose of the tool and point the back of the tool from that point. The opposite of that is two point. So I can create a point in space. Uh, cut pattern is the same here. The tool is following the cut pattern and it's pointing towards that point all the time. You can draw a chain. So there is many different ways you can control the tool axis and I won't go through all of them. And then we have the collision control. This combination here is actually an old, very old five axis programming trick. Um, some call this the clean core programming method. And actually we will have a detailed presentation on how to do this uh, later in I think next week or week after. So this uh, this tool path is a combination of three controls. The cut pattern is, is just a slice parallel cuts along this uh, part. The tool axis control is normal to the surface, but not normal to the this human head. It's, it's a normal to this core that we put inside. And then collision control or tooltip control, we told Mastercam to never violate this human head, which is a whole bunch of surfaces. So we, this resulted in a clean toolpath, uh, not violating this outside surface. Here is an example of a helmet shield trimming toolpath creation workflow. So what happens when you're creating a toolpath in Mastercam, a five axis toolpath? Cut pattern is this blue spline. That blue spline is broken into many small, many segments. And on every segment, there is a point created and a line drawn. And the line is called the vector. And that vector represents the direction of the tool. So as the tool goes around here, it will follow these direction vectors. Here we are actually using a two-point uh, tool axis control. We have a point somewhere in the middle, and we told the told master them to point the tool towards that point as it goes, trims around this the outside edge of the surface. So the first step, now this is in a textbook of how to create this tool pack. What's not in the textbook is this. First, you have to figure out which machine you're gonna put it on. You might have multiple machines in your shop. And then say we selected this machine, where should this part, part sit on the, on the table? We know that we cannot really put it on the table because we wanna trim it all around so there is not enough room. We know that it has to be above the table somewhere. So we will 
you will have you will make a decision and on a really educated guess you say well i gotta lift it so far up so the next next point is create a tool path and then look at this tool path and make a decision do you like this tool path tool path oscillates up and down using the fruit of the tool well so the tool is not waiting in one point you can look at this from all different angles and say i like this tool path it does exactly what i want it to do next you would go to run machine simulation and something you can do in simulation is levitate the part that you couldn't do in a real machine without having to design and make a picture so let's see how this motion looks like on simulation same tool path red is bad this is a collision is this a programming error again you have to make a decision here how to fix that one way to fix that is we could just move this part further out from the center of the table and hope that will avoid collision now you can even make a picture maybe this is a little bit premature but say we made a picture move the part out look at the simulation same toolpath still, no collision, but we are getting very close to machine limits. So that's not advisable. You want to stay in a stay in a machine envelope, working envelope. But luckily we made this fixture so you can adjust the head on the fixture. So we rotated the part up. And when we run this toolpath, there is no collisions. Uh, we are closer to the work area. But is this the most most accurate way you could cut it on this machine? Again, it's your decision here. This picture was prematurely designed. It doesn't need to be this high. It could be way lower. That head could be much closer to the center of rotary of the table. It would cause less motion and it, the part would be more accurate. So there is always a better way. Now, here are some concepts that you should follow when you're programming five-axis machines. Hey, Carlo, we have a quick question for you. Yes. Are there any other benefits of oscillating than just using the whole tool more efficiently? Yes. Um, depending on the material you're cutting, uh, you know, if it's some porous material or some hard materials, your tool would be notching in one spot. It would be waiting in one spot all the time. Oscillating the tool up and down moves the that cutting pressure away from the from just one spot on your flute. So your tool actually will last much longer. And you will get better better surface finish as a result because you're not filling your tool out. Hope that helps answer the question so the um things that you should consider when you're programming multi-axis machines is use toolpath visualization tool did you notice that so that's what we did so far we we ran simulation just to just to talk about the con concepts now these visualization tools are the first one is backplot then you have verify and then you have machine simulation use your breaks that means um, when you're doing indexing work say the you're attacking the park from different angles you always rotate the, the part lock your brakes your rotary brakes and machine the part this is the rigid state of the machine then unlock the brakes rotate to the new angle lock the brakes machine from there so if you can do most of your roughing like that, it will be more, more accurate because the machine is not in the loose mode with the brakes off. It's in a rigid mode with the brakes on. And minimizing machine motion is a big one because a lot of people new to multi-axis get all excited when they have a multi-axis machine and they can move it all around. It looks very impressive. But actually minimizing motion should be a goal. Well, let's just talk about that for a little bit here. Um, 
if you had only a three axis machine and you wanted to cut a circle, you know that three axis machine cannot cut a circle, right? It's uh, we do linear interpolation, meaning we are moving X and Y simultaneously like this. And every 90 degree, our axis has to reverse. So if you, on, on the machine control, there's a parameter where you can set the circular tolerance of the cut you wish to make. Um, if you set that tolerance real tight, your feed rate will be dropped on the machine. You won't be achieving whatever feed rate you are programming. Now, if you have a four axis or five axis machine, you can cut that same part this way. This is less motion than this. And here we are only limited by the, the accuracy of the bearing on this machine. Um, here is our example of how that would work. Here is a linearized motion. And here is rotating, forcing rotary. Now this, some machines have this ability. So on some machines you can set this in a controller. Uh, the, the machines that don't have that ability we can set that in master cam. In master cam, we can adjust the post processor to out, output this kind of motion. Another example is um, here. We actually use this example to calibrate machines. If you look at this this rotary here and cut this part, which one do you think is more accurate? Obviously, this one will be more accurate than this one. The one on the left does all this motion. The one on the right, uh, the part is sitting in the center. So the closer you can put your part to the center of the rotary, the more accurate your cut is going to be. Now, this is not always possible, but this is some of the considerations that are not in a textbook that you should be considering. Uh, this is a real life example from a customer. A customer sent me, sent me a toolpath and sent me these pictures. Toolpath looks like this. He's finishing, this is a knee joint. And he said, okay, I wanna make a picture, picture and here is the picture I made. I wanna use this dual rotary device to cut this. Can you give me some feedback? So I looked at the toolpath and obviously the toolpath looks okay, but it, it's not efficient, needs some cleaning up. But that was a, that's an easy part. I sent him back this simulation. I didn't have a model of his picture. So I just put the part where his picture put it. And this is the motion you get. You get all kinds of flipping, reversing along the part. And then I put a, rotated the part and I sent him this simulation animation and said, okay, using that same toolpath, if you turn this part 90 degrees, same motion exactly, um, this is your motion, way less motion on the machine. So this is much more efficient. And again, this is a non, not in a textbook example. And then he had ended up making uh, this new picture, and this is how he ended up cutting the part. And if you look at these two pictures, you know, this one and this one, this one is not any harder to make than this one. But this one here was a, a waste of an effort um, making a, that picture before thinking about the motion on the machine. Now, we have this signature parts project. Uh, I mean, all our signature parts are delivered, delivered with multiple step-by-step -step demonstrations. They can be used as training tool by our MasterCam com community or demonstration tools. They come with a detailed demonstration of how we created a toolpath. By the way, this toolpath that I was showing you on the beginning is the same clean core method. We created these blue, these blue surfaces 
inside the shape that we wanted to cut. And we told Mastercam to cut that shape, just parallel cut, spiral down, but compensate the tool to the actual outside surfaces. And this is what that looks like in the interface. Now we have a very detailed presentation on this on the YouTube, uh, part of our signature part project, where we give you the, the files, the, we give you uh, PowerPoint exactly step-by-step. Step. This is how you create a toolpath for the whole project. And we have probably around 50 of them already online. So if you go to this uh, YouTube video, uh, you will see Ian presenting this step-by-steps, roughing with a multi-axis saw, and he starts from the very beginning. I'm not playing uh, sound here. I'm just gonna jump ahead just to show you how this was created. So we just created an inside toolpath, jump ahead, Ian does an explanation and on every detail here. And then uh, we cut this somewhere here. This is a two path we actually generated. The next step is to actually add the surfaces, these surfaces, and now we are avoiding those surfaces. And then there is this problem. If we went down straight, there would be a collision. So to avoid that collision, we make some changes. We change the gradual tilting angle by 10 degrees, I think. Yes, and uh, that gives us a motion that will avoid the collision with the part, like that. And on the very end, you run simulation before you commit to the machine. So this is a, like a five minute uh, detailed presentation that you can watch on online. The next step is to cut that part on something like this. Like this customer is cutting stone. Uh, this is a 40 inch saw blade, uh, 40 inch, one meter for uh, metric people. And they have different challenges, right? They have, See, a fixturing is not so much of a problem because gravity helps you. As you know, you cannot bend stone, so you have to cut it like this, and they can cut all kinds of different shapes using that saw blade with, with a five-axis head. Um, this is another example of a similar machine cutting this. Uh, it looks like a big tub out of stone. And again, here we are doing, uh, using a saw blade, we are changing the angle of our cut because the saw blade, if it stayed in this orientation, it wouldn't fit on the bottom of that half sphere. So we actually have to tilt the angle of the saw as we are going down into the, into the bowl. Okay, so, Programming five-axis machine is all about dynamic thinking, mixed with a, with a preoccupation of avoiding collisions while keeping the machine in its work envelope. Machine limitations are always a reality. Here is an example of something we, ca we call singularity, causing axis, axis reversal, rewind, and even crash. Many of these issues can be solved very simply with some experimentation. Let me just show you the motion. Right there, we are, did a reversal, then we doing a rewind and continue cutting. What we wanna do is just do this. Now this is, again, not in a textbook how to fix this, but it's a very simple fix. Um, here are some other limitations. There's a, we are doing some deburring operation on this part. Uh, with full five axis motion. There's a lot of motion going on here to do that deburr. 
and here we go with uh, with a mutating head, much simpler. There is machine limitations are always an issue with something like this. We call this singularity when when you have uh, motion, you're just cutting along, and there is the whoop, rever reversal, and then a rewind over here. That's not what we want. That's usually before because of the singularity. This is what we want. We want a smooth motion. This is uh, very easy to fix, but it's not one of those things that you can find in the textbook. Um, the next example was doing a deburring motion on a five axis machine with excessive motion here. This is way too much motion to, for that deburr, which would not be possible with a five axis head that is a nutating head. So we simplify that motion and just kept it four axis. This customer is actually cutting a uh, lens uh, for NASA. It, this is not cutting, this is actually a polishing wheel. And it's like a little belt center that he's using to cut. So this is a similar programming method using a um, same kind of tool axis control method as we use for the saw. The message of the, this whole presentation is to encourage you to think outside the box. Experiment. 